Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, our sort of first meeting of uh, our group as it's now known as the Arts and Cultural Heritage Working Group. Uh, a lot of folks will have known us as the DLF Museums cohort, but we changed the group's name earlier this year to sort of reflect the uh, uh, the broad variety of institutions uh, our membership are affiliated with. Uh, so we'll keep things uh, pretty short today. I have a uh, shared notes doc and agenda. Feel free to drop your name in the list of folks who are attending the meeting. Um, feel free to, uh, if you scroll to the bottom, there's a section for you to share if you have any upcoming events or work to promote to the group, feel free to add that to the doc. Um, and otherwise, feel free to add uh, any notes or questions as they come up, you can either add them into the doc or add them into the chat um, if during the presentation, then we'll sort of get to everyone's questions afterwards uh, when we turn off recording and have the discussion portion of the meeting. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand things over to uh, Jamie, who uh, uh, really, Appreciate you volunteering to uh, share this with us today. We're really excited. Yeah, I am too. Thanks. And it's nice to see you in like semi person. Um, hey, everybody. I'm ex I've been excited about this all week. Um, uh, thanks so much for uh, uh, coming. I haven't been a part of this working group. <laughs> thanks, Jenny. So some of you I know and some of you I don't. Uh, my name is Jamie and I work at the Library of Congress. Um, and before that, I worked in the personal digital archiving space and created um, this public digitization station and program, public education program called the Memory Lab, um, which uh, uh, is became IMLS funded and um, is uh, at a bunch of different public libraries um, around the country. Um, so I feel like I'm more known probably in the DLF community for that work maybe than what I've been doing um, at the library for the past couple of years. Oh, thanks, Gail. Um, <clears throat> so I when I saw that the name had been changed from uh, the museum's working group to arts and cultural heritage, I just immediately reached out to ask if I could have some time and join this group and start a discussion in a space that I've been thinking about a lot lately. So I hope it seems relevant for those of you that are here. Um, I run this, it's kind of like an artist residency program at the Library of Congress called the Innovator in Residence Program. And it's been around for about six years. And we're on our fifth resident now. And I've never really had the space. I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but I just haven't had the space to kind of think about the experiences of the different residents and the trends that have been emerging because it's just, it's been just break next week to try to get their work out in a year and you know what I mean like have it be something that um we could share like that the library was okay with sharing like as an organization and all the outreach that comes with that and then the public engagement that comes with that so it just it never felt like there was time and um I think uh I I made it a goal uh for this year to try to have more opportunities to think more strategically about the program and talk talk to other people about their experiences with hosting artists in residence or like what they're finding that artists are encountering when they try to work with, um, you know, with their archives or with their collections. So this is the first time that I'm kind of doing that, I feel like in a meta sense. And so I'm really happy to, to start the conversation and see what things, you know, are interesting to you. Um, so the structure for the hour I was thinking was, um, I'm going to do like a quick chatterfall activity because I want to get a sense from everybody of your context and um, some of the things you're thinking about when you saw the topic for this uh, working group discussion. And then I have like a 15 to 20 minute presentation that I prepared. And then I have this like, um, if you're familiar with liberating structures, there's like a, um, a couple of structured activities that uh, my team at LC Labs does a lot on Zoom calls so that everybody gets the chance to speak and kind of share their thoughts equally. So I, I have an idea for a structured activity, if that's what we want to do, or if, you know, conversation's flowing and we don't really need that, then I'll scrap it. Um, so that's the plan, and that'll be um, the hour. Um, okay, so if that sounds good to everybody, I'll start with the chatterfall. So if you haven't done a chatterfall before, 
the way it works is that I'm going to ask a question and, and we'll have a couple minutes to kind of think um, think about it and type a response, but you won't hit enter yet until I say go so that everybody's answers um, waterfall at the same time. That way uh, you have the space to, to think uh, yourself instead of being influenced by other people. And it's just, I don't know, it's kind of fun. So I have two questions where we'll use the structure. So this first one will take two minutes. Um, I just want to know like where, um, what context are you? <laughs> Thanks, Tenny. I appreciate the emojis are like, um, Elias, I like uh, seeing your responses. <laughs> um, so uh, the first question I have is just where, like, what's your context, um, professional or personal for why you're interested in this topic? And like, what are you hoping to learn? So context and uh, what are you hoping to hear about or learn? All right, and if you're ready, we'll go. Okay, so we're just gonna take a minute here to read everybody's answers. I'm seeing, if you don't mind, I'll just, I'll read some for everybody. I'm seeing Jenny is um, really interested in learning how artists have changed libraries and maybe dream what can be done in this area. Caroline. Okay, personally as an artist, cool. Interest in digital humanities. Yep, there's lots of overlap there. And Jack, hoping to learn how library resources can collaborate better. Museum exhibitions, okay. Elias. Do the programs focus on things other than traditional scholarly research? Okay. And public educators. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap. I want to learn about artists who not just residencies. Sorry, I'm reading Malia's. Mm -hmm. How to fund and host an artist residency. Okay. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we have people coming from different types of cultural heritage institutions, which is cool. And I'm seeing um, a lot of interest in like how to ideas for like running a residency um, or paying for it. And I haven't included a lot of that in my presentation, but that's certainly something that I can speak to and answer questions about. And we can take some of the discussion time to do that um, as people have questions. Okay, um, and so this next part again will be like a minute and a minute same format. Um, what do you have to offer, um, like for this working group today? Do you think um, it may be a little bit redundant to the first one because I see some of you are saying you're artists, but all of you are coming with experiences like related to this. So, um, what do you think you can offer, like kind of in the context of this discussion?
All right. And if you're ready, press enter. All right. And Leah, back on art museums. Okay. I love that there's so many artists uh, here. That's really, it's so like um, surprising for me. I actually don't get to work with people that are artists and librarians very often. So it's just very exciting. And I think your perspective is really important. Um, I'll show probably. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, Gail, sorry, I'm reading yours. The experience with community engagement and outreach is like half, <laughs> like half of the work. So very relevant. Oh, that would be, Devin, that's really helpful. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the types of things that artists have been interested in so far. Cool. Okay. Great. Um, okay, so I'm going to kind of take all of this and as things feel relevant in the presentation that I prepared, I'm going to digress a little bit to some of the things that I'm seeing come up in the chat. This is super casual, so um, I'm going to share my screen, but I'm just going to keep it in the PowerPoint um, software so that I can bounce in and out to showing examples online. Please um, interrupt me. It doesn't uh, bother me. Um, if you have a question like about a specific project I'm talking about um, or just something tangentially related, um, I really welcome that. So share my screen. Okay. Um, so for this kind of like one of my like first attempts to try to synthesize, I think, what I've been learning from running this program over the past five years. One of the biggest things I've learned, and it's like I kind of knew it maybe intuitively, but I have like a whole grab bag of real examples now and like kind of a, some ideas of like where to go next. And I'm curious how much it resonates with you all, is that, um, you know, the the Library of Congress where I'm coming from, our, um, our archive, um, like many archives, have many artists in them, <laughs> but was not built for them. Um, it seems to be that the, you know, the digital archive um, does a really good job of showing um, content as in, you know, if you're looking for a particular historical moment or something like that, but if you're looking for a color palette, or if you're looking for a um, uh, a type of uh, musical characteristic, right? Like for a song that you're making, it it doesn't do a good job of doing that. The known path is very like text-based and is very kind of content-based. And then there also seems to be, um, you know, a lot of context for preservation reasons, which makes a lot of sense um, that in uh, a lot of ways is confusing um, uh, to uh, someone who's coming to remix or like, um, you know, re reinterpret collections. It's uh, like technical and kind of irrelevant. So with that, with kind of looking at those, um, some of those barriers, I'll kind of give some examples of the different artists that we've had and some of the things that I'm kind of seeing over and over again and paint a picture of what um, I'm starting to think of as like a roadmap for what we could do to make our digital archive more relevant for artists and why why we should do that with all the different priorities we have, like why, why would we put money into this thing? Um, I feel strongly that we should, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, first thing I wanna do though, is talk about money. So um, my sister division in the digital strategy directorate at the Library of Congress is called the Connecting Communities Digital um, Initiative. And it is, um, funded by the Mellon Foundation, and the purpose of it is to um, engage communities of color around the country and uh, with our collections and also learn how to better serve groups that we traditionally have not served well. 
So there are, we're right in the middle of a bunch of announcements of um, residency and funding opportunities that are coming out and they probably will be relevant to um, folks on this call who are here for personal reasons or professional. So the first one is the artist or, or scholar in residence. Um, my colleague actually just shared this on the DLF announce listserv. So if you're on that, it, this is just fresh in your email. I think she sent it about an hour ago. Um, the CCDI folks are paying $90,000 um, to two, two folks that they'll appoint for $90,000. They can self-identify as an artist or scholar um, or hybrid of both who wants to um, uh, work uh, with library collections in some way. And uh, there, there's more details in the in the email, um, but the application period for that will close on August 7th. So in um, whatever that is, like a month and a half. Um, and it just came out, so it's kind of a tight turnaround. So please share that widely. Um, uh, apply yourself um, if you're an artist or scholar and you think that's interesting. This one probably be relevant for a lot of people here. Um, they're uh, giving out grants for libraries, archives, and museums. The application deadline for this is uh, September 7th. It's up to $70,000 to support three local cultural heritage organizations um, by enabling storytelling across the platform. Um, and the projects have to center on one of the following groups, Black, Indigenous, Hispanic, or Latino, Asian American, or Pacific Islander, and or other communities of color. So there has to be a specific audience focus in your pitch um, for this grant. And I'm gonna um, share this deck so you'll have these links, but also if you search CCDI Library of Congress, you'll come to the page that has all of this uh, information. And then the last one, if any of you work at a um, minority serving higher education institution, there's a, a separate grant initiative for that. Same deadline, same amount of money, up to $70,000. Happy to answer any questions about that that you have to the best of my ability, but um, all great um, programs and um, pretty good money. Um, so, okay, so let's get into it. Um, why am I running a residency program? I work on this team called LC Labs and we help support the Library of Congress's digital strategy. So it's like, how can the library kind of, um, age gracefully into the future is a way, those are my words for how to think about it. Um, but, you know, we uh, were constantly trying to um, keep up with um, disruptions that are happen happening, like through technology, et cetera, and react to them in a way that's responsible and also thinking about future planning. And we do this through three different methods. We run experiments um, and we publish the findings of those on our website, labs.loc.gov and share them with our colleagues. We, want, we run residencies, um, such as the Innovator in Residence program, and then we also do convenings. Um, some convenings that we've done recently is the Machine Learning um, and Library Summit that happened in uh, right before COVID, um, and we published a report about that, and we've also done a couple of collections as data uh, symposiums over the years. All the videos for those are online, and there are reports that we've commissioned for those as well. Um, okay, so I'm just going to run through a couple examples of artists we've had, um, what they did, and uh, what I've been seeing as like trends for what's been challenging about working with uh, digital collections in general. So the first innovator in residence we had is the data artist, Jer Thorpe. So he, um, it was like intentionally a pilot um, with him because we wanted to work someone with someone who had had experience working um, for like with large digital archives before. So Jer had previously been a resident at the New York Times. They had a data viz residency that he did. And he also worked for National Geographic as a resident. So we felt like he was like a seasoned person to kind of try to figure out how we would run something like this. And it was really, really helpful to um, have him be the first because he could be really honest about the ways that he was supported in residencies before he came, right? And like how we were doing that and how we weren't doing that so well. And it wasn't personal. It was just like, I've done this a lot and this is a way that you could improve. So it was really great um, to have him. And what he found pretty quickly is that even though we're one of the largest libraries in the world, we really do not have a lot of large, um, uh, homogeneous data sets. 
like we don't <laughs> we don't have anything at a scale that's like clean and ready to like make apps with or like make visualizations with in the way that he probably was used to at a place like the New York Times. And one of the, you know, this is a long time ago, it was like 2017, but one of the things that we did have, which all libraries have, right, is, um, well, at least most libraries have, is mark, mark records. We had mark records. We had lots and lots of mark records. And we had done this like big data dump of all of our mark records from the very first to, to um, when we released them in 2017, 2018. So that actually, even though he had ideas for other things and and those things didn't work out, unfortunately, he was able to pivot really quickly and use the thing that we had to try to make something engaging. So um, if you uh, look um, uh, at labs.gov um, at his work, he created, I think, seven or eight different um, web apps that allow you to serendipitously browse the Library of Congress's archives through us through different paradigms like time, like cocktail party from a certain year. This one is an example of color, like how to browse the collections by color. And the reason why he thought this was important was because he thought the archive was very focused on a certain type of user, a scholar that was coming because they knew what they were looking for. And he wanted to bring this idea of kind of serendipitous passive browsing of just like a generally curious person. He wanted to see how you could enable that like through the mark records. Um, so what was cool about, he did a lot of stuff while he was with us. Um, this was the project that ended up um, being the most popular, the library of colors that you're seeing. Um, and he visualized essentially a series of palettes um, that pulled from the title or like 596 field from a mark record and pulled a color term from that um, and then visualized it as a color. So what you're looking right now is a palette of um, our photograph collection that we had mark records for as of 2017. And as you kind of scrub across the palette, you could click on any particular um, item that would come up and click to see the original. So an example is that we have the um, uh, queer photographer Franc Francis Benjamin Johnston's um, uh, photography collection. Her garden collection is really popular. And um, this that's in this like still happens to be a picture of her two cats at their house in New Orleans. Um, and the reason why it's here is because the word brick um, was cross indexed with the color red as a palette. So it shows up in here um, as red and you could click and see um, the original image. So he did this for maps, he did this for literature and the color palettes look different for each one, which became really interesting for digital humanists that were um, looking at the application because they, um, you know, there was discussions on Twitter of like, why is there so much black and blue in the literature palette? And why does maps have these certain dominant colors? Which was interesting, but it was mostly just to make it fun um, and to make it just aesthetically and aesthetically pre pleasing kind of fun way to engage um, across um, a scale of collections. Since then, I thought this would be interesting for folks from um, university libraries uh, so our, our artists, when we, um, when they work as residents, they're actually, um, contractors, like they, we draw up a contract with them and they sign it. So it's not the same as, um, you know, working under grant money or, you know, something like that, or, um, an endowed, uh, chair position, which we also have at the library. These are uh, contractors. So we have to have a contract where we say like what their deliverables will be. And because they're all funded with taxpayer dollars, everything that we agree that they're going to deliver is CC0 license. Um, so I think that's really important. And that, and we also require that they deliver on top of the work that they make um, a lot of documentation be, and as well as any underlying code will go into a GitHub repo. So I'm saying that for context to say that what's happened a couple of times, which has been great, is that there's like an instance of what the our, the artist does with us, like Jared did Library of Colors with us. But um, a couple years later, the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign um, commissioned Jared to create a Library of Colors with their um, holdings. And it opened, it says it in this thing, I haven't seen it in person, but yeah, in 2021. So it opened in 2021 and it's actually on their campus in the East foyer of their iSchool building. And he did something a little different. <clears throat> Not only is the color palette visualizing their actual holdings, 
but um, he did a thing where the the screens that show the color palette in the installation reflect the time of day. So in this example, it's kind of like a dawn dusk palette. So items that kind of show dawn dusk will show up at those times of day versus nighttime, if that makes sense. Um, so he did something a little bit different with it. But I think that's part of the beauty of um, some of the choices that we've made about this program that's continued to be great is that um, it's uh, what they make goes into the public domain, but there's an opportunity for the artist to do other instances of their work and claim intellectual property, you know, on that in the future if they want to. So it's kind of a, I think it's like a win-win, but I'll, I'll talk more about IP um, in a little bit. Uh, Citizen DJ is probably the most popular um, uh, work that has come out of this program. It was created by Brian Fu, who actually has a background in museums. He was working at the Natural History Museum um, in New York at the time when he became uh, our innovator in residence. And now he works for CCDI, the Library of Congress, uh, which is awesome. Um, so uh, Brian had a background in cultural heritage, but he also had a background in hip hop and was a musician and was a b-boy when he was young. And um, he uh, really didn't like what the 90s and copyright did to the sampling community of uh, hip hop. And he thought that a really great thing would be for the National Library to basically create a national crate of free to use sounds to kind of bring back um, the, you know, the, that 80s, early 90s, you know, um, heyday of hip hop and sampling and creative remixing um, that uh, further copyright leg legislation kind of like reigned in. So uh, he had a very clear user group in mind, like I want to make something for um, hip hop artists that are looking for samples and can't find them. Um, and he saw um, a unique opportunity for us to do this as a as a national library. I'm not going to show the part of this video um, because it will take too much time, but I put this in the slide deck because um, when we release the, the app, um, which you can find if you just search Citizen DJ, it allows you to sonically browse sounds from a collection. You can click onto any one of them to find the original item with its context. You can download samples uh, to use in your own music making software. And it also has like a very low tech DOM that's free. Um, so you can like mix stuff and hear different drum tracks over it and kind of see if you want the sound or not. So it's a way to kind of like try it out, you know what I mean, before you commit. And it was so fun because we found all of these uh, people online, like in the Reddit community and on YouTube, making tutorials like for their own communities about it and saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe the Library of Congress did this. Like, this is such a cool thing. And this was one um, that this artist, Ghetto Styles, did that has a really big um, YouTube following and is always sharing like resources with fellow musicians. And he endorsed the product. And, um, you know, I think a, a lot of folks like who were watching the video had probably never used the Library of Congress before. So I think this is a great example of the types of things that can happen when you have an artist um, see a need and you, uh, uh, you know, this was, how do I say this? This was a really hard project to pull off um, as the home of the Copyright Office. The Library of Congress houses the Copyright Office. And the reason why that is, it's probably obvious, but I'll say it, which is that, um, like, we don't, we've never had a history of endorsing the fact that you could use particular free to use uh, materials online for commercial use. You know, we've never said, here's a thing. And did you know you could use this and make money with it? But that was kind of implicit in this project was that we were making samples for people to then make music and sell it because they were artists and that's how they make their living. And that type of paradigm and the work that we did with our general counsel and our colleagues in copyright to have everyone understand why this was worth the risk of doing and the, the, the work that we did to really make sure that everything that we were putting in here was one, ethically okay to sample and two was like totally free to use and there was no question. All of that work was um, 
uh, the kind of boring background part of the year. Like that's what we spent a lot of the year doing. The, the technical part, the machine learning that Brian had to do was kind of the quickest part. And I think that's an aspect that a lot of people don't um, know and that I'm, I'm still kind of thinking about because there's a lot of lessons just in this particular example. Um, and people still continue are, are continuing to use Citizen DJ in so many creative ways. One of the things I'll say why I think it's important to make changes to make our digital archives work for artists is that um, artists then in turn, um, <laughs> artists then in turn like look to the things they make for inspiration or use the things that they make for, um, to, to do more. So there's this kind of like snowball downstream effect of, you know, you're paying an artist to do something and then what they make, they other artists see you as relevant all of a sudden as a place to go and then the things they make become relevant and um so it's just a huge return on investment and what i'm showing here is um we did this national user testing campaign because it was covid when the work came out and um everybody was at home so we were like could you help us with user testing like play with this tool you know let us know what you think we'd love to incorporate you know your feedback into the final version and as a part of that search, um, we had people op optionally self-identify as who they were. And as you can see, the majority of people saw themselves as artists or just kind of generally creatives um, that were interested in using the tool. And that is not similar to the types of self-identification for other digital products that we make available. Um, I am going to play this while I'm talking. I, I don't know if the sound will share, though. Let's try it. Maybe not. Can you hear that? First of all, first of all, first of all I feel very blessed. This so blessed. Wonderful thing. one of the things we found is that um, with this release, we had all of these like awesome collaborations happen where people were using the tool and the samples to um, make collaborative compositions um, from different places around the United States. This is an example of a group, uh, Harbanger. Um, they ended up performing at the Library of Congress, and all of the samples that they're using are from the Citizen DJ platform. But it was so creative um, and just really, really like fantastic, completely unique, completely unprecedented use of what we were making available. That is the whole video is so awesome. Anyway, that was one example, but there were a lot of them. Um, another example is that uh, in the outreach section of Citizen DJ, you'll see this in a number of the case studies of from this program. Um, at the time when it came out, it was COVID. And so a bunch of teachers and especially after school programs were really struggling to figure out how to create um, engaging after school programming online um, and making that kind of turn. So we ended up um, using Citizen DJ the summer after it was released to um, sponsor four different after school um like hip-hop education community programs around the country there was one in miami there was one in detroit one in um, new york and one in chicago and we worked with the um the teachers um to share the tool um and they all did projects like with their students using citizen dj so they would do a little bit of history research they would make a song or they would use sound in a podcast presentation that they would do it was used in a lot of different ways but it was so so cool that it was um uh free and um uh, could enable virtual i guess like collaboration you know even in a um education context which was not the um main purpose um, last thing I'll say about this is that, uh, there's no like out of, at least at the time, I don't know, like may, I'd be curious to know if, if you guys know of anything new, I know British library is doing a bunch of stuff with the uh, sound sampling, but at the time when Brian made this and like Elsie labs was like helping him with this project, there is a lot of like off the shelf tools for working with time-based media for text, right? So like speech to text or something like that. Um, but not for analyzing sound to find a key 
or to find like a part of the song that was very high quality that wasn't scratchy you know like those types of very it's like the aesthetic that a musician would care about there weren't a lot of off the tool products for that and Brian built that and it's now like free code online um so we have this hope still we haven't seen it happen um but we have this hope that someone else will try this like with some of their AV material, like as a pilot. Um, so if any of you do want to try it or you're interested, we would be happy to collaborate um, to see how this works. Most of the pipeline that he made should be ready to go. The only thing that's different is that he used the Library of Congress's API to grab AV material out. And instead you could upload you know, your own things, or if you have an API, you could point it at that. It would just be the first part of the pipeline that would be your context but the rest of it is the same it's looking at a film that has an audio track or audio and finding the pieces of it that are sonically significant and then classifying them with like a number of parameters that allows you to sonically browse them um i'm looking at the time so i'm gonna just very quickly say that um, another case study that we had um, was from someone who was from the artist Courtney McClellan. She was an innovator in 2021, so after Brian, and she has a fine arts background, had worked in um, uh, museums, is based in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, in her work uh, with museums, she found that um, a lot of um, especially younger visitors to the museums, the types of engaging activities that they wanted was an ability to remix or like visually kind of engage with material that was on display in the museum. I don't know if anyone here from a museum context has also seen that, um, but coming with that background and also coming as a fine artist, her um, project as innovator was to create a annotation application that would host certain free to use items from the library's collection. I think there's like maybe 30 in the app. And she, in a in her print studio, like handcrafted um, uh, symbols and, um, you know, quotation marks and like things, and then digitize those to allow you to like stamp the item, make text on the item. Um, and then there's also an affordance in the application where you can, <clears throat> like if you're in a classroom, annotate an item and then share it with another student to like annotate theirs, almost like an exqui uh, um, exquisite corpse style, like engagement where you like layer it. And the user testing that we did with, for this was, it was still um, um, COVID protocols where most uh, classrooms were online. So she um, got permission to work with a couple different middle schools and high schools around the country in both urban and rural um, school systems. And they did testing um, with this tool um, to inform uh, the way that it works now. Again, this is open source. You could upload your own um, items into it. Because it is annotation, um, annotation based, there's a, I mean, with, with actually every single one of these um, applications, uh, there's documentation and a part of that is like ethical use. So um, for this particular one, so for Brian, he made um, a guide for ethical sampling. Um, like, how do you do that? What are the types of questions you think about? For this one, there's a guide in the repo that talks about what are the types of things you need to think about when you think about giving someone an image to annotate. Um, especially if you don't have control over who the person is that's annotating. Who's depicted in the image. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 a whole it's a whole list, um, which was useful as we thought about what it would look like for other um, institutions to adopt the app and use it. So, if you have questions, more questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Um, like Jer, Courtney um, is continuing to use the uh, Library of Congress's collections in her own work. Um, this is a part of the Atlanta Biennial that happened in 2022. She used, uh, it's, a, it's a blueprint of the Carnegie Library that we have in our photo archives or something. She used them as a digital art piece display um, titled The Advancement of Learning, and it was um, put over you know, an intersection as a digital billboard in Atlanta while the biennial was um, happening which was very cool to see. And I think she still continues to use, you know, to look at our archives um, for inspiration for her work. Uh, 
the last um, one is our current innovators. So we haven't really talked about this, uh, about Jeff's work like too publicly. There's a couple of blog posts that you can find online. We've done a couple of um, Instagram and Twitter campaigns. Um, but uh, Jeff is a Korean American artist. He has a background in environmental acti activism and he was one of the co-creators uh, of Public Lab. Um, and he is uh, doing this uh, project with us. He'll actually be staying on with us for a second year, which is the first time we've done that for this residency. It's usually only a year, but we're going to make it two. Um, and he is visualizing destroyed uh, Chinatowns around the country. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, him working with a Sanborn map um, to recreate um, a Chinatown that no longer exists in Providence, Rhode Island, which is where he's from. This is an example of that. Um, it's a walking tour, a uh, virtual reality tour of that. Um, and he just announced that the second site is gonna be um, a series of Chinese gardens in Portland that were destroyed. But the main thing that he's doing with us is actually not these prototypes. Like that's not like the deliverable work. Um, the deliverable that we wanted the most was for him to make a toolkit that has videos and tutorials for how anybody could do research with a, a digital collection if they don't have experience and um, create one of these 3D models, you know, for a neighborhood that's relevant to them. And a lot of this work has been him sharing um, how harming a digital archive can be and like what are the things that a person needs to think about when they're doing this type of relational reconstruction work and like where is the archive like appropriate for that and how um, how is it not? And one of the main things that he's starting to talk about in his blog posts and will, I know in his second year is that the strategy for a lot of this work because our archive and so many archives are so uh, white centered is that finding traces of things like Chinatowns from the 19th century that have been destroyed are often, you're just looking at the edges of a picture or at the edges of an image embedded in a newspaper that has a racist caption. You know, it's like this type of very, very harming detective work of like looking at the edges for the very precious thing that's taking you a hundred hours to find. Like that's what the work looks like. And so he's really engaging with that and working with different folks in different neighborhoods around the, sorry, I think my video is slowing down. Um, so next year he's going to be um, taking this on the road and um, working with other neighborhoods interested in, in doing this and kind of user testing the toolkit to improve it and try to figure out how to make these methods more accessible for folks that are interested in this type of um, ancestral work. So museums will be a place that we really um, uh, hope to be. He's done work in the past with places like Culture Hub. He's done pop-ups at museums. And he's been prototyping a lot with virtual reality, low tech. Um, I think my video is slowing down a little bit. I'll just stop it for a second. Let me know if you're having trouble hearing me. Um, so this is him wearing a VR mask that he and he made a, um, a, a Korean um, a Korean like folk mask as the container for the for the VR. Uh, app on his phone. It's like a holder for that. So he's very interested in mixing like very, very analog, very, very accessible um, techniques with digital to make these things more fun and make them more experientially felt in real time, like as a group. So we're really excited to try um, some of these methods in, in person um, next year. Okay, this is where I'm going to um, end this kind of like tour of like the, you know, uh, these are case studies. These are some things that artists have done in residency with us, but I want to kind of end with this, which is as I'm beginning to think about the things that we've seen, like across all of them, th there's a lot, a lot to unpack, but some things that just came to mind for me a couple of days ago, as I was planning for this, the first one is that I think there, we have a lot of evidence now of why engaging and funding creatives is so useful for making our digital collections relevant. It just, the work that they do to interpret it makes them relevant for um, communities. Um, and I think that um, it's not only the work that they make, 
it's the fact that as because they are in residence, we get to see in real time their experience trying to navigate, right, our staff, our digital collections with their kind of like weird, I'm doing like bunny ear quotes, but you know, these kinds of strange questions like for our reference staff and how that works for them and how it doesn't. So we get this great, um, uh, you know, sense of what it's like to actually do the work, the deliverables as well, you know, become gifts to the public because they're all public domain. And then I would also say that for, you know, for a lot of the artists, they they stay friends. Like we're, we become very close. They stay friends. They stay a part of our network um, and have um, continued to um, engage uh, their own communities with um, some of the resources we have at the library. So the problems, high level problems that I just keep seeing over and over again, rights, rights are, um, not discourse. So the first thing is that um, the library is doing work right now to standardize its right statements, which is a fantastic first step. Like it'll be so great when that's fully implemented. And that's awesome. Um, that's not the case right now. And also um, for a lot of our archival collections, they're not described at the item level. Now I understand like for, for museums, that's different. I know there's a lot of rich item level metadata in museums, but for a lot of archives and libraries that I've worked in, that's not the case. Um, and it really has to be. Because um, a lot, even though the artists might be working at scale, a lot of times they are working on the item level and they don't understand the actual right statement for that particular item. The nuance of it isn't reflected at the collection level right statement. So it's just constantly an issue. And a lot of times we end up literally walking around the halls of the library, going to vertical files and having conversations with archivists that like remember more details about the gift agreement to really make sure that like the right statement is very clear and when it wasn't we went to the artists themselves to ask um I think the other thing about it is just that what we learned with Brian making that rights guide is that <clears throat> if the rights is not explicit that you could use it you're either one going to use it irresponsibly or you're not going to use it at all. Most of the time what we see is that folks just don't use it at all, right? Like they just don't engage because it's too hard. Like it's just not clear like if they can remix something or not. Or, you know, understanding is what I'm doing truly transformational and so it doesn't matter if it's under copyright. Like all of that is just so um uh it's such a barrier that it's like not worth engaging and that's what we find most of the time. The other trend that I see is that what I was mentioning earlier are the discoverability avenues in the digital collection just seem to be very focused on historians, I would say, um, or uh, like for our own like preservation needs. And there are real, very specific things that like I could put in a roadmap tomorrow for what an artist needs when they're navigating the digital collections that we've seen from all of these innovators. They want to see the shape of a collection in total. And what I mean by that is, like, instead of getting lost in the individual items, they want to see the example of, like, for a full collection, what is the color palette of that collection? What are the types of aesthetics that come out? Like, when you're looking at a visual collection at scale, if it's a sonic collection, they want to know what types of sounds are overrepresented. What is the main key you're seeing here? Um, there's, like, different aesthetics to to the shape of a collection that they want to engage with before they go too deeply in um, because they they know technically you know certain aspects of what they're looking for for their work so there's not only a need for like add affordances for these types of what i would call like creative um discovery facets but also they also need deep item level metadata that preserves the context once they find, you know, something that they want to use, because they are very, very interested in engaging with the provenance of these items. And a lot of times that's a huge part of the narrative, like of their um, artistic work or artistic practice. So to not have that metadata will be, you know, a huge thing for, um, well, I'm going to move on, right? I just, I don't know, there's not enough information about this item for me to use it, so I'm just not going to. So it's it's a hard problem, right? Because all of this is resourcing. It's requiring metadata enrichment. It's requiring you know item level metadata, um, which is so resource and labor intensive to do. I understand all of those things. Um, 
the two other ones I'll say is stories that inspire. So I think when I first started running this program, what I was thought <laughs> was that people would just say, oh, you're one of the largest libraries in the world. Like what a huge medium to have, like to find stories. But um, it's actually, it's like, it seems so obvious now, that's why I'm laughing, but it's like very intimidating. <laughs> like, and there are so many paths that you could go on that it's actually in some ways not inspiring at all. <laughs> like what's inspiring is the is the, the the story of a particular item, you know what I mean? Or the, the types of context that you hear a curator talk about, or, um, you know, uh, uh, what you read about in like a, a blog post, right? That someone's taken the time to do. All of these types of secondary interpretive resources that I know all of you on the call have probably made at some point in your career, those um, entryways into the question of why would I care about this or so what has been so valuable for our artists because they really need a place to be inspired to start. And it's not looking at, you know, over a thousand collections, tens of thousand, you know, items online is just, it's, um, there's nothing to like put your teeth into, if that makes sense. I don't know. So these interpretive resources are so useful. And then, you know, of course, the beauty of having uh, the program is that the innovators in and of themselves then um, become the next people to make further interpretive resources, which is um, incredible. Um, so that's that's a huge issue. And um, the last thing is something I mentioned briefly, which is that uh, it's really important up front to negotiate and explicitly agree <clears throat> on what the breakdown is with the artist's own intellectual property and what you are claiming as an organization to own. So um, this is one of the few things we've done well from in, from the very beginning, and it was forced that way because these were paid with taxpayer dollars. But it's a very clear line for us, which is <clears throat> if we agree on this thing that you're going to deliver to us, it will be CC0. Um, and you cannot claim, you know, intellectual property on this instance of the thing. And that's enough for some artists not to apply. And we totally understand that. Um, but it's just the scope, you know, that it's, that's important for us for how this program is funded and the mission of it. <clears throat> wow. Not a lot of time for discussion. I'm really sorry. There are too many slides in here. <laughs> No, it was all super uh, fascinating. It was really great to hear about all these projects. Um, and I'm almost thinking maybe we could uh, coordinate uh, off Zoom to uh, plan a sort of continuation of, you know, the discussion portion of this uh, at a future call. Yeah, that would be great. So I know we only have six minutes left, but I think especially because a few of you I know, but most of you I don't, and because I haven't been a part of this working group before, if we were to do a second conversation or even asynchronous conversation like what are some of the things you can put them in the chat you can come off mute that really resonated with you because I'm fully aware that because I'm from the library like we're a weird beast and we're not similar to like a lot of university libraries or um, museum contexts. I know that but some things are similar so I'm just curious like what what was relevant from what I was sharing and have you had experiences, you know, with these same issues and serving artists or as an artist using a digital archive? Or any thoughts not related to that? Yeah, I can say, I was going to type it, but it might be just easier for me to say it. Um, I think the discussion about copyright in general was very important, especially mm -hmm. for uh, archives like mine, where we have a lot of artists who are still alive or that they hold the copyright or they there's living heirs to copyright. It's always kind of a minefield, to say the least, in terms of even basically sharing on our social media. So you know, I would love the CCP to have this kind of program, but I see that would be a huge problem, like you said, when it's in like ambiguous or there's some like murkiness that can really dissuade people from really taking um taking advantage of these. And another thing that I thought was interesting coming from a more archival field and you know, our aversion to item level description for the the a labor that comes with it, I think these alternate 
methods of description like the palette or like the sound of a collection is very interesting and I would love to explore that more with other collections and thinking like how we could how we can rethink description that way for in order to build archives like you said in the beginning for artists rather about artists thank you for saying that and one of the things i'll say about copyright is that in a couple of these projects um the artists wanted to work with an item so badly that was under copyright that they reached out with the help of our staff um, that have the relationship with the donor. And I would say about half of those um, interactions, the the person uh, said yes, because they really liked the work and they thought it was important and, and they were fine with it. Um, so it, I was surprised actually like 50% is a pretty high number to say, okay. Um, so I think that that will continue to be the case um and i think that it's just a question of like is their work you know something that the donor is like bought into or not you know and you just have no control over that i'm just using her content and how we can improve yeah so rita i can speak to that really quickly because my my team does a lot with like um uh figuring out who is using our digital collections we have like two million users a year i don't know i don't know what the right number is but it's a lot and most of them are a complete mystery because of the data that we capture and don't capture um and one of the things that's been such a huge game changer was tr was deciding that we were going to use uh our budget to fund embedded users so the the artists and residents i mean uh we decided that creatives as users were like a key user audience for us that we wanted to invest in but instead of doing you know like group i don't know like focus groups and stuff like that i mean certainly those are valuable but there's just something so valuable in having a one year long relationship with someone who is trying to build something with your work uh, i mean with the with the collections that you have online um, so that has been um, uh, a game changer for us and kind of humanizing like who those users are of our digital collections and learning very deeply the types of barriers that they're encountering. <laughs> Reading Caroline's, yeah, I know we have a minute left. I'll say um, Ben, oh, I can't remember his last name. I can see his face. There's a digital, um, a digital scholarship um, person who also uses our mark records to talk about the history of cataloging. Um, he did a presentation also, I think it was like 2017, 2018, where he visualized. Um, and it's a lot of it is a reflection of like congressional funding, right? And then you also see kind of a tracking of like how um, technology and computation like catalyzed the mark record. Um, and yeah, it's it's very cool. It's fascinating. Okay, well, um, thanks everybody for taking time uh, out of your day to listen. I'm really sorry that I didn't have enough time for discussion, but I'm interested in doing it if you guys are. I'd love to talk more about this. Yes, thank you so much, Jamie. And yeah, make sure you're subscribed to the uh, Arts and Cultural Heritage Group's listserv because we'll definitely make sure to coordinate and send out any announcements through there. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thank you all for joining us today. This was a really uh, great talk. Thank you. Thanks.